Ah, oh, so glad you asked. I thought you were never going to get there. <laughs> um, and why does God seem like such an asshole? Well, I think you should read the Bible very, very carefully, um, or else you will think that God is an asshole. <laughs> And that it's um, not something that should be undertaken lightly. Uh, it's not the equivalent of a legal constitutional document that is supposed to set out what is good for you, set in black and white. It was not dictated in one go as the Quran is supposed to have been dictated. Uh, it's a book that bears witness to huge cultural shifts uh, over a period of time with some elements of very ancient texts but a form of editing that comes into comes pretty close to the time of Christ if we're talking about the Hebrew scriptures and then a really quite dazzling collection of preachers manuals that attempt to enable people to bear witness to something that happened in the midst of all that and gave them a key to reading everything that went before it. So before reading the book is well worthwhile realizing that the only reason we have the book is because a group of people who we call the apostles bore witness to something happening in their midst that really shook up their world and that what they're passing on, on to us is the shake-up <laughs> with the texts that help make sense of the shake-up. But if we just take the texts and think they're something else, then we're going to be left with an <laughs> our own and blame it on God. <laughs> does that, does that, yeah, and what does the shake-up reveal to you who God m might be? Uh, well, in a sense, we've tried to talk about it before, how uh, uh, I want mercy and not sacrifice. Uh, the collapse of all forms of religion as being somehow dependent on violence and sacrifice, on the Jewish movement towards that understanding and on its definitive demonstration. But you need violence to sustain structures to support life. That's mm -hmm. what I. That's what's been revealed to me by being human. Yeah, and so the really difficult thing to do is for us to learn to, to understand the ways in which institutions co-opt us. Not that I like it. It kind of sucks. But it seems yeah. like I trust people around me, and it seems like the smartest people and the leaders. Like you have to have again, like a nuclear weapon to have leverage in order to be safe. So. And I think they're honest and true, so I can't imagine another way that we could all be together. I don't think it's a question of them being either dishonest or untrue. Uh, the moment we start being, uh, we start having institutions, we find that we are run by things that we think we are running, and that's the definition of idolatry. <laughs> so the question is. How do we learn to take responsibility for what we are really doing under the disguise of things that are running us? And that's never easy. Excuse me. Uh, you were talking about the Bible. Uh, yeah, I could never be into a God, or, you know, like would have Abraham kill his son. So, yeah. Like, what's your, could you tell that story and what's your take on that? I mean, it's just good um, for other people to hear a different imagination. Yeah. Um, I think that the, the Abraham story is one of the most successful pieces of editing in the Hebrew Scriptures as its editors dealt with the problem of child sacrifice. Because you can see in the, that even at the time of the fall of the first temple, so between about 600 and 580, even at that time, the issue of child sacrifice was sufficiently alive as the kind of thing that lots of ordinary 
Israelites, Hebrew people, thought was an acceptable, or indeed thought was something demanded by God, that you've got two major prophets railing against it. Jeremiah saying, that's awful, that never crossed my mind, says the Lord. That's another God, that's Baal. Uh, or Ezekiel, more or less at the same time, taking the reverse line, saying, that's awful, but I did give you those commandments. I made you do those things so that you become disgusted by, by them and give me glory. In other words, you get <laughs> two entirely different tacks, one pretending it wasn't God and one saying, yes, it was God, but it was supposed to make you sick. I said you would give it up. Uh, so you can see that there was a, a real struggle at the time in what really was of, uh, was of God. And I think that the beauty of the uh, Abraham story, which is left with uh, indicators which we don't often get in our English translations, is that you have Elohim, one of the older words for God, doing all the ordering up as it orders Abraham to go and do something which, of course, many people would have thought that it was Abraham's duty to do. So it was a perfectly ordinary thing uh, to instruct Abraham to do. We tend to think, how, what a horror that God is uh, ordering. But remember that that order would have been one that everybody would have thought, or a huge number of people would have thought would have been ordinary. So he's ordered up. And then at the top, when he's about to go through with it, um, it's the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, who stops. And it's the angel of Yahweh, or Yahweh, who, as it were, walks him down, gives the stand down order, and then gives the blessing. And what that suggests is that the real act of obedience, see, we tend to think it must have been a huge demand on Abraham's obedience to sacrifice his son, uh, whereas that might have been a comparatively ordinary request of obedience. The real act of obedience was to consider that he might be good if he didn't sacrifice his son. In other words, the obedience was in the hold back, accept the animal instead of the human being, because that involved giving up a whole sense of the old sacred. But at the time, everybody would have thought was, was the real thing. It's what, it's what the Bible says, it's clearly it's clearly the, what's good and right and conservative and, you know, thinking that maybe you could sacrifice an animal instead, that's wishy-washy, liberal, atheist uh, thinking. So for Abraham to find himself in the position where he trusts that God will provide for sacrifice, in other words, he doesn't need to sacrifice in order to please God, and that he will therefore have all the blessings of his inheritance is rather extraordinary. It's, it, it shows a huge shift of epoch, quite cleverly edited into a text. And the extraordinary thing about it is that the editors of the text don't completely edit out the older version of the story, because immediately after the angel of the Lord, or the Lord, has blessed Abraham and his descendants forever, including us, it then says, then Abraham went down the hill and joined his young men and they went off to somewhere else. Uh, and you look at the verse and you say, can I be missing something? Where is Isaac? There is no Isaac. Isaac doesn't come down from the hill. They've left a trace of the older story <laughs> in place. Isaac only appears in a later cycle <laughs> in Genesis. Was that intentional, or think maybe it was happy hour and they just left? Or? No, I think it was intentional. Remember that the, the scribes had very great uh, um, respect for the letters of the text. So editing work was done, but it was done with very great circumspection. Um, and they're constantly leaving these little hints that something has been altered here. But that's one of the, the glaring ones, you think. Why didn't Isaac come down the hill with his dad? <laughs> then how do we read the Bible? Well, that takes us back to where I was saying you before. Uh, it's the extraordinary story of the huge progress towards understanding that God does not demand sacrifices, that sacrifices are our way of making ourselves good by pointing out someone who is to blame and who receives responsibility, and that our 
being enabled to stand free of all that was done by Jesus occupying the place of death and shame, becoming, if you like, in our language, the sacrificial victim, meaning we murdered him, so as to show us that sacrifice is abolished forever. And with it, all the cult cultural institutions that depend on sacrifice start to shake at their... Uh... Cut. <laughs>